Okay. Good afternoon. I'm proud uh, to welcome everyone to today's briefing and hearing on press freedom in the Americas. On World Press Freedom Day last month, President Obama brought attention to an issue that far too often goes unnoticed. He said that last year was a bad one for the freedom of the press worldwide, and more media workers were killed for their work last year than any other year in recent history. Unfortunately, this is particularly true here in the Americas, where press freedom has been deteriorating over the past few years. I call today's briefing and hearing to shed light on this disturbing trend. When nine journalists are murdered in Honduras in five and a half months, making the small country the most dangerous one for journalists in the hemisphere, or when Mexico's drug cartels brutally murder members of the press for reporting on the drug trade, uh, we cannot sit idly by. When the Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez shuts down opposition TV and radio stations and intimidates journalists and media owners who express dissent, we all have a responsibility to speak out. And certainly we must continue to shed light on the stark state of the press in Cuba, a country with one of the worst media environments in the world, where 25 of the estimated 200 political prisoners are independent journalists. These are, ju these are just a few of the most troubling examples of the breakdown in press freedom that we see in the Americas. And I hope that we will have a chance to examine these trends more closely. While none of us in the inter-American community are quick to speak out when electoral democracy is in peril, we sometimes, while most of us are quick to speak out when electoral democracy is in peril, we sometimes neglect to raise up our voices when other fundamental aspects of democracy are, are at risk, including a free and independent press. Yet in reading the Inter-American Democratic Charter, a charter agreed to on September 11, 2001, by every country in the hemisphere except Cuba, we understand that democracy is about much more than just elections. Of course, free and fair elections are essential, but the Inter-American Democratic Charter must also be utilized to ensure that fundamental freedoms and democratic norms are safeguarded. This means that we must speak out when the press is under attack in the hemisphere as freedom of the press is a central tenet in any democracy. I'm particularly pleased to welcome OAS Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression, Catalina Botero, who will brief the committee prior to our hearing. Ms. Botero, your office does tremendous work in highlighting the breakdowns in press freedom in this hemisphere, and we all look forward to hearing from you. And after the briefing is over, I will introduce our hearing witnesses. So I thank you, and I'm now pleased to call on Ranking Member Mack for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I'd like to thank our witnesses for being here to share their experiences and insight, especially our international guests who have made special arrangements to appear before us today. As a congressman in the United States, it is hard for me to imagine living without the freedom to speak freely and express my individual beliefs and those of my constituents. Freedom of expression is a cornerstone of democracy. The establishment of free press, one that provides oversight to government activities by disseminating information to citizens, is essential to a functioning democratic society. Less than 90 miles off the coast of my home state of Florida, the people of Cuba lack these basic rights and continue to suffer under the iron-fisted regime of the Castro brothers. As we speak, Alan Gross, a U.S. citizen, is being held without charges at a high-security Cuban prison where he has been for over six months. His only crime? Providing internet access to the Jewish community living on the isolated island. Mr. Chairman, it is also necessary to draw attention to the continuing deterioration of press freedom in Venezuela, which you just spoke about as well. Last Friday, the president of Global Vision, a well-known opposition television station, was issued an arrest warrant for trumped-up charges generated after a 2009 raid of his residence. This is the second of such arrest warrants he has received this year, and he is not alone. The government of Venezuela does not stop at arresting individuals who express contrary opinions. It works tirelessly to eliminate these opinions entirely. This past January, the government of Venezuela completely shut down the Venezuela TV station RCTV. 
finally achieving a goal that began in 2007. Today, I call on President Hugo Chavez to allow for free and fair legislative elections in September by removing the government's interference in the media and stopping the intimidation of opposition voices. In addition to these severe cases of repression in Cuba and in Venezuela, countries throughout the Western Hemisphere continue to witness diverse threats to press freedom. Such threats occur through nationalization of the media outlets, the enactment of laws to restrict media freedom, recently seen in Argentina and Ecuador, lax prosecution on behalf of the government in media intimidation cases and direct government harassment of reporters and journalists. Given the levels of press freedom often act as an indication of the broader trend of political and social freedoms within a country, we must take into consideration the other factors at play within these countries. For example, in Mexico, Guatemala, and El Salvador, attacks on journalists are regularly tied to their reporting on drug trafficking organizations and criminal gangs. As we work with governments in the region to be more vigilant in their prosecution of crimes targeting journalists and the media, it is important that we address the role of these criminal organizations. It is also critical that we recognize the vast improvements made in some countries such as Colombia. As we, fear, as we hear from our witnesses today, I'll be looking for ways to expand upon such progress in our hemisphere and to ensure that the recent trends in Honduras and Venezuela do not become the norm. I would also like to discuss the role of new media in the effort to ensure continued access to free media sources. When I hear of the courageous bloggers in Cuba who, against all odds, continue to tell their story to the outside world, I am confident that technological innovations has the power to stifle government efforts to intimidate and shut out opposition. I look forward to the discussion, Mr. Chairman, today. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses, and I want to thank everyone for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Mack. And now for an opening statement, Mr. Ceres. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding today's hearing. Freedom of the press should be a critical requirement for the development and stability of a democratic nation. It offers citizens greater opportunities to inform themselves, express their personal views, and empower them to pursue social justice. Without it, no country can really, can truly enjoy the benefits of a vibrant democracy. Journalists who report in some countries in the hemisphere face increasingly volatile and dangerous conditions where they not only face dire threats to their personal security from gangs and organized crime groups, but also face government intimidation and the continuous rollback of press freedoms. A Latin American and the Caribbean Freedom House characterized Cuba and Venezuela as not free. The government and its leaders continue to undermine democracy as they suppress press freedoms on a daily basis by closing down media outlets that don't conform to the beliefs and, the in and imprisoning innocent reporters. Today in Cuba, 22 journalists are in prison. In, in ranking of countries with the most jailed journalists, Cuba was ranked third just under China and Iran. Similarly, Venezuela faces extensive censorship of media and press. Freedom of speech and the press, while constitu constitutionally guaranteed, has been increasingly eroded with numerous restrictions. Due to these restrictions, we have already seen the closing of numerous radio stations and RCTV. Additionally, the Venezuelan regime continues to harass journalists to the point that self-censorship is the only option to avoid serious danger. Additionally, many countries, including Mexico, Colombia, Guatemala, face increased self-censorship by the media when covering stories relating to organized crime. We must continue to support and protect the work of journalists in the region and decrease the power and decrease the power criminal organizations have over freedom of information. Freedom of the press is a fundamental right that all countries should respect. I thank Ms. Marino for her briefing, and I thank the chairman for holding this hearing. Thank you, Mr. Ceres. And now for an opening statement, Mr. Smith. <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member, for scheduling this very important hearing. Article 13 of the American Convention for Human Rights clearly states that, quote, everyone has the right to freedom of thought and expression. This right includes freedom to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas of all kinds, regardless of frontiers 
either orally, in writing, in print, in the form of art, or through any other medium of one's choice. And most importantly, that this right shall not be subject to prior censorship. Mr. Chairman, it's not an overstatement to say that freedom, the freedom of any people, depends upon the freedom of the press. And yet, in a number of the countries in our hemisphere, the press is not free, and journalists are targeted for harassment, beatings, and frequently murders. Those sl slain have often crossed local officials and their private sector cronies by uncovering corruption or investigating human rights abuses by their governments. Some have just dared to criticize their governments. Through inaction or inaction, impunity or censorship, Mexico, Nicaragua, Venezuela, and Honduras in particular have been forgetting their obligations under Article 13 and the basic necessity of a free press to a healthy nation. Cuba, in its paranoid grip on its citizens, has been imprisoning and torturing journalists for decades. Mr. Chairman, journalists are also affected by the sad trend of recent years to transform the internet into a tool of censorship and surveillance. With the internet has come new power for the people to share information and hold power to account, and thus a new target for the abuse by those who hold power. Formerly oppressed and silenced groups have used this new media to their advantage. El Nacional reported that in August of 2009, Hugo, Hugo Chavez dubbed Twitter a new agent of terror after a massive torrent of tweets under the tag Freedom Media, Free Media VA criticized his governments of censoring Venezuelan media. And Chavez has been openly contemplating censorship and control, probably with the help, as we're seeing all over the world, including in Belarus, with the help of the Chinese cyber police who have perfected worst practices on how to control any dissidents uh, in their country. Mr. Chairman, we do have a bill pending in this committee. I am the sponsor of it, called the Global Online Freedom Act, backed by virtually every human rights organization, including Reporters Without Borders, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, Freedom House, and even Google. It requires our IT companies, when they are in an internet repressive country, to disclose what it is they're censoring and to put beyond reach of a secret police personally identifiable information uh, so that when somebody goes online and they go perhaps use email, uh, that email is not intercepted by the secret police uh, to find them, apprehend them, and then incarcerate them, especially as they do in the PRC. I hope that we can take a look at that bill sometimes very soon before this, this, this Congress completes its, uh, its sitting uh, because we need to help those who want to use the Internet as an opening rather than what is becoming in these some of these countries as a tool of repression. I yield back and thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Smith. And now we've been joined by Mr. Rohrbacher, uh, calling him for an opening statement. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I take a special interest in this particular emphasis on human rights because uh, unlike uh, many of my colleagues here in the United States Congress, uh, I am not a lawyer. In fact, that was the course most, uh, that, that really was my strongest political slogan in my first campaign, vote for Dana, at least he's not a lawyer. And uh, how, so what, how did I earn my living? I was a writer. And I started out as a journalist in Southern California, off and on, uh, for about 10 years before I joined Ronald Reagan in his efforts to become president. And uh, he then took me with the White House and I became his speechwriter for a number of years. However, I never forgot my days as a journalist, and I never forgot uh, the dynamics that are at play at getting information to the people of this country and how important that has been to our freedom. And if we do stand for freedom and democracy, we must understand that in none of these societies, especially in the Western Hemisphere, will there be freedom and prosperity unless we have a free press unless people are able to ask tough questions and make serious investigations into people who have power. And uh, I uh, look at that uh, both on personally as well as professionally and as well as I might say patriotically. That's what America is supposed to be about. We're so, if, if the United States isn't for press freedom and, and these other human rights, then what are we about? We're just a combination of people who come, came here from all over the world in order to make money? I'm afraid that's not it. The people came here from all over the world, yes, to live in prosperity, but essentially to live in freedom, which led to prosperity. And there will be no prosperity 
without freedom and especially freedom of the press because it will be overwhelmed as it is in China and elsewhere. It will be overwhelmed by corruption. Uh, and for the record, uh, on, on a sort of a tangential issue, uh, I would just like to express, Mr. Chairman, my disappointment that uh, the current president of Honduras has decided to give in to whatever pressures were put on him to suggest that he accepts the idea of the transfer of power that happened uh, leading up to his election was in some way a coup rather than a protection of constitutional rights by the Supreme Court and the military of that country, as well as the Parliament of Honduras. Apparently, he recently uttered the words, yes, it was a coup. And uh, I am really worried what pressures caused this, this man to do that. What threats were made on the president of Honduras? Was, did our embassy threaten this? In fact, uh, when I was in visiting Honduras, Mr. Chairman, I suggested that the best thing for Honduras and everyone would be to close the books, recognize there had been a free election, and move on looking forward rather than, look, rather than looking back and trying to fight battles of the past. Obviously, some people have been putting pressure on President Lobos to do the opposite. And I would hope that whether it's uh, uh, whatever we're talking about, whatever government we're talking about, we're not talking about a fight against evil things in which we will then seek vengeance on people who actually were engaged in, in repressing reporters and things such as that. What we want to do is build a free world, and we've got to enlist people who are on the other side, meaning people who are on the side of these tyrants, to join in and to create a better place. And uh, you don't do that by just rehashing everything that happened in the past, but what we have to do is make sure in the present everybody is on the record as to what direction we want to go. So this is a way to do it this hearing. I'm very proud to stand with my fellow members, especially with Chris Smith, and we've been fighting on human rights issues for 20 years together. And uh, this issue of freedom of press in this hemisphere is of utmost importance because it will, it will ensure prosperity and peace as well as freedom. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you, Mr. Rohrabacher. And uh, now it's my pleasure uh, to introduce Catalina Botero, the Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression at the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights since 2008. Ms. Botero previously held several prestigious positions in Colombia. She served as an assistant judge with the Con Constitutional Court of Colombia from 1995 to 2000, and again from 2005 to 2008. As Special Rapporteur, we have all been impressed by your willingness to constructively point out both the deficits in press freedom in the region and the progress made in certain countries. I was particularly pleased by your recent annual report on press freedom, which provided an excellent summary of media-related concerns in the hemisphere. Ms. Botero, thank you for joining us today. The floor is yours to brief members of the subcommittee. Le doy la palabra. Gracias, señor presidente. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chairman Engel, Ranking Member Mass, distinguished members of the Subcommittee on Western Hemisphere. It is my privilege to address you this afternoon regarding the crucial issue of press freedom in the Americas in my capacity as a special rapporteur for freedom of expression of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Among its many activities, my office prepares an annual report on the state of the right to freedom of thought and expression in the Americas, providing us a unique perspective from which to assess the progress and challenges that exist throughout the region. While my remarks will necessarily be brief, I will take around eight minutes. My presentation today is based on the Rapporteur's Chief 2009 annual report copies of which have been provided to the subcommittee. This report includes a detailed discussion of the state of freedom of expression in nearly all the countries in the hemisphere, including those I will discuss today. Mr. Chairman, just 30 years ago, Central America was submerged in painful and widespread military conflict and the southern cone was subject to dictatorial regimes. 
this subcommittee is well aware of the profound damage on human rights and freedom of expression that those regimes brought to the region. The last two decades of the 20th century mark a true democratic rebirth in the Americas. Today, progress in the area of freedom of expression, although insufficient, is notable. Freedom of expression is enshrined in nearly all of the hemisphere's constitutions. In the majority of states, mechanisms of direct censorship are virtually non-existent, and several states have repealed the offenses of insult and criminal defamation. Without ignoring this undeniable progress, I would like to focus a reminder of my remarks on the challenges to freedom of expression that continue to exist in the Americas. Today, I will discuss three overarching challenges to enjoyment of this right. First, an increasing violence against journalists and the troubling impunity for crimes committed against them. Second, a growing contempt in some governments for the crucial importance of freedom of expression to vigorous and healthy democratic regimes. And third, the excessive concentration of media control and ownership and a resulting lack of pluralism and diversity in the marketplace of ideas. The first challenge, violence and impunity, continues unfortunately to be in my office primarily concern. In some parts of the region, death is the unacceptable price that courageous journalists are forced to pay in order to fulfill their duty to informing the citizenry of what it is entitled to know. In 2010, at least 12 journalists have been killed, at least seven in Honduras, four in Mexico, and one in Colombia. And many others have been kidnapped, threatened, and assaulted, something we should not tolerate. The principal threats to the safety of media workers come from extremely violent criminal organizations and illegal armed groups, such as drug traffickers, paramilitaries, and guerrillas. Organized crime in order to thrive requires secrecy, and journalists are targeted precisely because they threaten criminals' ability to operate in the shadows and quietly infiltrate state institutions. The important battle against organized crime, in the important battle against organized crime, there is an additional risk to journalists. And it arises when those on the front lines of this battle are not trained to understand the value of a free, independent, and rigorous press corp and respond to journalists' criticisms of their actions by identifying the media itself as the enemy. This vicious circle is regrettably closed by impunity. An investigation by my office found that between 1995 and 2005, 157 media workers were murdered. And in the Americas, only 32 convictions conviction, were handed down. I therefore believe that the protection of the press must be a priority in the struggle against organized crime and my office has urged states to adopt specialized protection programs for journalists and to create dedicated prosecutorial units to investigate crimes against freedom of expression. We have also urged neighboring countries to provide support to such programs, as well as offer temporary or permanent refuge for journalists facing serious threats. The second overarching challenge we face is a growing contempt in some governments for the crucial importance of freedom of expression to vigorous and healthy democratic regimes. This disdain, to put it mildly, expresses itself in many ways, but, but common to all of them is the misuse of the state's power to silence dissident speech. In Cuba, Freedom of expression simply does not exist, and anti-government speech is often punished with harassment and imprisonment. In Colombia, high-ranking members of the state intelligence agencies have engaged in ongoing systematic efforts 
to undermine and intimidate independent journalists and other government critics. In one instance, intelligence agents went so far as to issue detailed instructions to threatening a journalist and print them on an official letterhead. The instructions included a threat to burn the journalist's daughter alive. In countries such as Venezuela, the criminal law has been used to jail and harass journalists and others who the government accuses of offending public officials or institutions. The Venezuelan government has also used its regulatory authority over licenses and concessions to arbitrarily restrict the operations of critical media outlets. My office is deeply concerned about the situation in Venezuela, and you will find here in our annual report a complete and comprehensive report of the situation in that country. Likewise, in a number of countries, lucrative government advertising is assigned arbitrarily as a way of su subsidizing friendly media outlets and punishing critical ones. In short, while the days of formal censorship wars in Latin America are largely consigned to history, governments have found new ways of silencing speech that they find disturbing or inconvenient. Perhaps the most flagrant recent example took place in Honduras, following the last uh, year's Corvette, when the militaries occupied media outlets by force. We cannot spare any effort in creating legal frameworks that guarantee the rights of citizens to freely express their opinions and ideas, even if those ideas offend, shock, or disturb. The final challenge to freedom of expression that I would like to discuss is the excessive concentration of media ownership and control and the resulting lack of pluralism and diversity in the marketplace of ideas. Latin America and the Caribbean have has historically been characterized by extreme concentration of media ownership and control. Consequently, enormous sectors of the population, including indigenous people, Afro-descendants, and the poor, especially the poor women, have been completely excluded from the communicative process. In a region with the most unequal wealth distribution in the world, and with a history of institutional and de facto discrimination on grounds of gender, race, and class, this is no a small matter. As such, the Office of the Special Reporter has laid out standards that encourage a vigorous, open, and free media market, but also one that is inclusive and takes into account the obstacles that disadvantaged groups face in making making their voices heard. We believe that laws which combat public, but also private mo media monopoly, are and remove barriers to entry for independent community broad broadcasters are legitimate and often necessary. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you about this critical issue. I look forward for your questions, and I would like to be precise and clear. So. I will uh, speak in my own language with the help uh, of a member of my staff, uh, staff who will translate the answers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Botero. Um, let me ask you this. Um, as Special Rapporteur for Freedom of, the, of Expression, you've been outspoken in defense of press freedom in the Americas. The OAS's Inter-American Commission on Human Rights has also played an important role in speaking out on these issues. So I'd like to ask you, do you think the OAS Permanent Council on Human Rights does enough, enough to address press freedom violations in the hemisphere? And what more can the OAS Permanent Council and its member states do? Uh, what about the OAS Secretary General? And what more should be done by executives and legislatures in the region to bring attention to press freedom concerns? Mr. Chairman, as you uh, know, the OIS has two different bodies, the political bodies and the human rights uh, inter-American system. Our work 
is to point out, to highlight the problems that we face in the countries. The work of the political bodies is to take into account what we are saying in order to um, try to find a way to resolve those problems. I prefer to speak about my work and the work that we're doing in, uh, related to freedom of expression. You can see, as uh, everyone, what the other part of the OIS are doing. Um, it's not my work to talk about them. My work is to tell them what we think about what's going on in the region. But are you, are you satisfied with, with the work they are doing in, in the things that you have uh, worked so hard for? I think they can do more, much more, more in resolving the problems that we are facing. Okay, thank you. Um, you mentioned about journalists uh, being murdered, and you said that uh, seven have been murdered in Honduras uh, in 2010. Um, by that account, uh, it makes Honduras the most dangerous in the hemisphere for the media. Do you have any specific recommendations for the Honduran government to stop the crime wave against journalists, journalists? And how would you assess the commitment of the Lobo government to protect at risk journalists and make progress in investigating the murders of journalists? We have been in Honduras uh, last month, and we have to say that we don't see a strong commitment in the fight against impunity. We haven't seen any investigation related to those murders. We haven't seen any result uh, of those non-existent investigations. We think uh, they have to do much more in protecting journalists under risk and uh, uh, in post uh, investigations that th already we, we, we don't know. We have, uh, let, me speak, let me say this in English, in Spanish. Hemos solicitado. Excuse me, Ras. Que se hagan investigaciones especializadas. Uh, the government engaged in specialized investigations and queries. Especializados with specialized bodies para lograr resolver, para lograr identificar to identify the causes de estos muertos. of these deaths. Los periodistas en Honduras Journalists in Honduras están are terrified. Thank you. Let me ask you one uh, final question, and this one involves Venezuela. Uh, on Friday, arrest warrants were issued for Guillermo Zuaga, the owner of Venezuela's Global Vision, and his son. As a press release from the OAS's Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression said, and I quote, the journalists and owners of Global Vision have been subjected to constant stigmatization and threats from the most senior public officials, as well as attacks from private groups aligned with the Venezuelan government. So let me ask you this, as the country's September legislative elections approach in Venezuela, do you expect further clamping down on the press similar to what is happening with Global Vision? The other question? Excuse me, can you repeat the question, please? Uh, just the last part. The, uh, yeah, um, the September um, legislative elections are approaching in Venezuela. Do you expect it to intensify in terms of clamping down on press not only with Global Vision, but with others as well. I can't say, I hope not, but we have s seen uh, increasing uh, harassment those days. So maybe, mm, I, I won't say this, but maybe the things get worse, yes. Thank you, Mr. Mack. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. And I, I, I recognize that, uh, well, first of all, thank you for being here and for your report. Um, I'm, I'm curious, I know you don't want to comment on what you think other countries should do and what the OAS should do, but do, can you highlight uh, in other Latin America countries, uh, what other countries are doing well 
that uh, are not happening in, let's say, Venezuela or others uh, that have had a marked difference in the freedom of the press and freedom of expression. We have a chapter in this report um, with some uh, failings that some countries are doing well, really well, best practices. For example, in Brazil, we have very good judicial decisions that struck down uh, some laws that came from the dictatorship area. In Uruguay, they, just, they, they uh, changed the law, the criminal law, to decriminalize de um, freedom of expression. Um, w well, we are in Mexico, we have some advantage in access to information and even in, judicial, in the judicial uh, recognition of uh, inter-American standards on freedom of expression. Yes, we do have some good practices in the region. And, and so you would, it would be, you, it would be easy to say uh, that if some of those best practices were then um, applied and demanded from the OAS to the other countries, uh, that we could see an improvement in the freedom of the press in those countries. Uh, Mr. Congressman, yes, I do think so. I have been working with the Brazilian High, um, Supreme Court, with the Mexican Supreme Court, uh, with the Assembly of uh, Uruguay, and I think, yes, our work improved. Yeah. Uh, and they also help us to understand some problems and to have some new uh, solutions for all the new problems. I think we're doing a good job. My, uh, my concern is that uh, I, I don't have a lot of faith that uh, the OAS is um, strong enough in its protections of democracy in the hemisphere, uh, including the freedom of the press, that uh, I think there's some real questions about whether or not they, uh, the leadership of the OAS is really inclined to protect the freedom of the press and democracy. But let me ask you a question. Um, uh, you, you mentioned in your report that Venezuela refused to allow the commission to conduct an on-site visit. Um, can you specifically explain why they didn't let you in? And then how, do you, how would, were you able to make your determinations if you weren't able to do an on-site? when there was a coup attempt against President Chavez. The Inter-American Commission- are you, are, you, are you referring to his, uh, his first coup attempt or are you referring to another? Uh, no, no, another, yeah. The one against him. There are lots of coup d'etats. The one against him. The Inter-American Commission of Human Rights reacted um, with precautionary measures for him on his behalf. And sent a letter to the person who back then uh, seemed to have power Para to protect Mr. Chavez. When President Chavez uh, went back to power, he immediately uh, was thankful towards the commission because of that protection. But soon afterwards, when the commission was started to be very critical towards his actions, he considered that that the fact that the commission sent a letter to the person who in that time seemed to have the power delegitimized uh, the commission's actions from then on. Special rapporteur thinks that criti uh, that uh, reaction is motivated in the criticisms that the Inter-American Commission has made towards the Venezuelan government. So what, we s what, what he's doing to the uh, the press in Venezuela, he basically did with you, 
unless you're going to say something nice about Hugo Chavez, he doesn't want anything to do with you. This, uh, yes, uh, I, I think uh, I think so, and this is what you've said in a different words in our review. And Mr. Chairman, if I just last, um, and and don't you agree that uh, uh, if you have a someone like Hugo Chavez that is willing to uh, intimidate and manipulate the press uh, for self censorship and uh, and go beyond that by arresting and and intimidating the press, that you really see a destruction of freedom and democracy in countries like Venezuela when that happens? I do think, and I really think so, that freedom of expression is a, it's, it's a key component of democracy. When freedom of expression is threatened, democracy is threatened. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mack. Mr. Sires. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Thank you for your, for your comments. Uh, I just have an observation. Maybe you can talk about this. Uh, it seems to me that Cuba has had a lot of experience over the last 50 years in suppressing the press. And it seems to me that now the model of Cuba is being exported to Venezuela. I see Bolivia is doing some work, also where the president just submitted some sort of revision on freedom of the press. And I've heard some rumblings in Argentina regarding the freedom of the press. Would you, would you say that the Cuban model is becoming the standard for some of these countries? El modelo de Cuba. No, I don't think so. Tú no crees que no? No. You don't think so? No, no, I don't would think so. Would you please tell me the difference? Yes. Um, in Cuba, just simply does not exist freedom of expression. There is no judicial independence. You just can't say anything against government because if you say a, a, a small thing against government, you can go to jail. You will be harassed and uh, imprisoned. I think you can say the, f the same thing is happening in other countries. Venezuela is uh, having a hard times in freedom of expression. Um, I think the situation in Venezuela is very, um, complicated, but I can't say that it's the same model or that it's the same, uh, that it's, it's, it's happening the same thing. Uh, you, even in Venezuela where you have no, where you have a serious problem with in the judicial independent, you still have something that you can't have in Cuba. Cuba just simply doesn't exist freedom of expression at all. Well, the, the reason I say that is because it was a gradual movement in Cuba to go to, you know, to get to where they are today. And I, and I see the same steps being taken in Venezuela, and I see some of the same steps being taken in some of the other places. So when I say a Cuban model, I don't necessarily mean that in one day to the next they're going to change, but it was a gradual situation where we have today. So uh, that, that's what I was leading to. If you want to have the Cuban model, you have to struck down um, the whole system, the whole rule of law, the democratic system. I can't say that this is happening in Bolivia, I'm sorry, and I can't say that this is happening in Argentina, for example. We do have some problems in those countries. Uh, in uh, Argentina, for example, the people from Clarín, the journalists from Cla Cla Clarín, has been harassment, harassed by uh, mm, people from the streets that uh, have uh, affixes, how do you say, um, posters against them and, you know, s things that we think are problematic, but they do have uh, uh, Estado de Derecho, rule of law. So, I mean, if... But you don't see, get, but you don't see Venezuela getting where Cuba is. Do you know how Venezuela... Ben, it, it Venezuela is a different, Venezuela is running fast. Excuse me? Eh, Venezuela is running fast. Está corriendo rápido hacia eh, límites intolerables. Uh, pero creo que todavía es posible echar para atrás. Can you say this again? Um, she thinks uh, Venezuela is running fast, but she still thinks that it's possible to stop that process. I, I saw the University of Nicaragua. Is there 
I didn't hear you say anything about Nicaragua. Can you talk a little bit about Nicaragua? Yes. Nicaragua has the same problems as other governments. Where they, um, they, um, uh, can you help me? Because I want to be precise. And ellos eh, convierten a los críticos en enemigos eh, del Estado y eh, presionan y sancionan el discurso crítico. Cada vez hay menos espacios para la disidencia. Nos preocupa particularmente que las personas que, tienen, eh, que no tienen espacios para pronunciarse, porque cada vez… They turn critics into enemies of the state, and uh, the spaces for the expression of dissident opinions are increasingly being cut. But, Ms. Botero, but isn't that what's going on in some of these other countries where if you criticize the government, you are made an enemy of the state? My time is up. Uh, isn't that what's going on in some of these other countries? Yes. Same thing? Yes, yes, yes. We, we really we do think so. For example, in Colombia, you see that. That's why we have some press releases uh, saying to the government of Colombia that they have to take into account the inter-American standards when they talk about the political critici or the criticisms or whatever. Sometimes in Ecuador, we see that. So, yes, I think it's a... Uh, it's, it's a, a pattern. It's it's something that's going on for the last uh, years. I don't know if we can call them a pattern yet. I, I don't know. How many countries do we need to call it a pattern? <laughs> no, I'm sorry. No, no, I know, I know. The, I, I understand your concern, and I'm concerned also. Um, but I think uh, th there are some governments that lose this democratic light that you can't say that there is a model already established in those countries. And that's why I'm fighting for. I'm fighting against that, uh, que, que el modelo se convierta en el modelo establecido en ese. We're, f we're fighting for uh, making that that model does not become a uh, standard in those countries. That's right. Thank you for your comments. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sire. Mr. Smith. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Botero, thank you for your report and for appearing here today. In 2006, I chaired the first in a series of hearings on the gross misuse of the Internet as a tool of repression by dictatorships. We heard from Google, Yahoo, Cisco, and Microsoft, and they testified concerning their role uh, in censorship and surveillance. And one of the key points that we pointed out was that a man by the name of Shirkao in China got 10 years when his... Uh, Yahoo email account was opened up by the government, um, and it, it was a very, very sad um, uh, display of complicity, wittingly or unwittingly, but certainly complicity with the hardliners in Beijing. China is now deploying its cyber police experts all over the world, as you, you probably know. In Belarus, dictator Lukashenko uh, is benefiting from Beijing's worst practices, and they're using it to stifle the opposition there. Venezuela and the PRC are very close, as evidenced by Hu Jintao's visit in late April, and I'm wondering if you could tell us whether you have uncovered any Chinese internet repression experts in Venezuela or anywhere else in our hemisphere. And while you're answering that, whether or not you believe U.S. IT companies have played a bad role uh, in those repressive countries as well. don't know, and, and I'm sorry, but I can't say yes. Could I, I ask you to look into that, though? Because in, in we're, we're finding that they're slipping in, uh, and they're advising the secret police of country after country, because uh, they've perfected this, sadly, in a way that, that just crushes uh, the dissent. We saw Ahmadinejad use Siemens technology uh, when there was a uprising against that bad election result, uh, which was, was unfortunately uh, manipulated. And, um, you know, so they're using high tech, and I'm wondering whether or not the Chinese model is being, especially in uh, Venezuela, if you could look into that, it would be greatly appreciated. 
we, we have no information on the subject. I'm so sorry. But please look into it if you could. Yes. Uh, secondly, let me ask you with regards to uh, Argentina's uh, media law that was enacted in late 2009. Um, it's been very much criticized. Several federal judges have enjoined it. Could you briefly explain why those injunctions were issued and OAS's own concerns about the new law? And could you tell us more, please, about whether, about your inquiries found to be behind the attacks on Clarín and the Nacions, whether they can be traced back to interference by the executive branch of the Argentine government with its major media outlets, and in the case of the massive tax raids, whether anyone was actually held accountable? The law was analyzed by the Office of the Special Reporter in the 2009 annual report, and you will find our opinion in a more, I will be brief in this uh, answer, but you will find here our opinion. Uh, we consider that the new law has considerable ad advances, especially if you take into account that the previous regulations was issued by the last Argentine dictatorship. The law creates a special regime for community-based radios and TV stations that we think is very important. Yet, there are some problems uh, with the law, such as a discretionary assignment of some radio frequencies. And there are some other problems that we already uh, signed. The law is being analyzed, as you said, by Argentinian judges, and Argentina uh, has a robust um, rule of law in the Supreme Court, which is highly respectable and independent. So we trust in the work that they together can do. And, and, and Clarine, and, and you said, okay. In Argentina, there is a situation of tension between the government and some media outlets. Uh, this is bad both for the government and for, and for the media. But the government is the one who is responsible for creating an environment of tolerance uh, that allows for a robust and plural and, and uninhibited um, debate. And that includes opinion that information that may be offensive and or, or shocking. The Office of the Special Reporter is particularly concerned about the stigmatization of, of some journalists, uh, especially from Karim, by certain social actors some of them close to the government. And we've se we have said that in our annual report. I appreciate it. I would like to thank you in conclusion for your very clear and unambiguous uh, indictment of Cuba and the fact that there is no press freedom there because we have members of Congress who, who praise Raul Castro and Fidel Castro and they do it frequently. Uh, and, and you've, you know, as the rapporteur has made, you've made it very clear, it does not exist, there's no press freedom. And I thank you for that clarity. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Mr. Rohrbacher. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I would again identify with Mr. Smith's last comment. Uh, uh, we have young people in our country who wear Che Guevara shirts, and I would be willing to uh, bet that of the hundreds of people Che Guevara personally murdered, that some of them were journalists. Uh, I know we took out labor union people and shot them. Uh, and. Uh, to see uh, uh, our young people, <laughs> idealistic young people wearing Che Guevara shirts is, a, uh, is certainly disappointing. I'd like to ask you some specifics on uh, this. First of all, let me note that on my first comment about uh, President Lobo's uh, reference uh, that uh, he acknowledged that there had been a military or a coup that had replaced his successors, I, I have been handed a report suggesting that he is now saying that, that he did not use that word and that coup, and that, uh, again, this shows you how important it is to have journalists doing their job because uh, there's a question as to what word was used and what the meaning of the word was and what the translation is. Uh, I would be very interested in uh, making sure that this is a good report as well, that now he's saying that he didn't say it's a coup. So, uh, so whatever it is, uh, we're talking about journalists here and the job that they do. Uh, it's been reported that we've had, what, seven or nine journalists in Honduras that have been shot since uh, uh, President Lobo has been inaugurated. 
now he is also claiming that he's working with the f b i and other people to get to the bottom of that the question is the journalist who've been killed first of all were there any journalists who were killed in honduras uh... during the regime prior to mister lobos mister when as uh... zelaya was president were there journalists killed there during those years as well not at this rate one years ago but not not the same rate i mean this is a very high extraordinarily grave rate so there's one or two that uh... is a but uh, that was a long while ago and so uh... but under uh... but since the conflict that it was arising uh... with the end of the zelaya regime and uh... the beginning of lobos uh... regime that uh... we've had an upsurge in this killing the journalists who were killed in honduras uh... were they journalists who were focused on uh... political and government or were they journalists who were reporting crime and criminal activity like drug related uh... activity at least four of them were reporting crime and uh... corruption one of them had um, precautionary measures from the inter-american commission of human rights because he was against uh, the coup d'etat or uh, so yes, at least four of them were were really involved in uh, those issues, and one was against the new government. Okay, so one was uh, uh, using his uh, uh, press uh, credentials uh, to focus on uh, what was going on politically at that time, the, the the change of power, whether we call it a coup or whatever it is, and. Um, but the largest number were involved in investigating criminal activity uh, like drug dealers, et cetera. Is that correct? And, and government's perhaps interaction with those uh, uh, criminals. Yes, at least four were reporting um, the criminal activities and okay. corruption. All right. Well, that's... Uh, that is significant, and significant uh, that in these countries, unless journalists are free to investigate corruption and investigate the type of criminal activities that go on, like with the drug cartels, etc., uh, those problems will never be solved. Those those criminals will never be confronted. And uh, I don't know, for example, how many journalists in Venezuela now feel comfortable in talking about their government's. Uh, possible association with uh, uh, drug uh, cartels in Colombia or not. Uh, but I would imagine this type of fear uh, goes through any journalist. Uh, and, and I would hope that uh, uh, we in the Western world will stick together and make sure that uh, where there is a, a criminal behavior that journalists feel comfortable uh, in investigating that. Uh, a lot of times the government is unable to protect people because they can't even protect themselves. We know in Mexico, you have a, a, I'm just looking through your documents here, such a huge number of, of journalists have been murdered in Mexico uh, while trying to investigate, as by the way law enforcement of people have been murdered. So um, I thank you for taking on the task of uh, shining a spotlight on this issue. It's vitally important, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for calling this hearing. Uh, thank you, Mr. Orbach. Uh, Ms. Botero, thank you very, very much for your very uh, good uh, testimony. And, uh, of course, as I said when I introduced you, we all appreciate the good work that you do, and thank you for appearing here today. We, we appreciate it very much. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. you. A quorum uh, being present, the uh, subcommittee on the Western Hemisphere will come to order. I've already delivered my opening statement, uh, but I would like to insert my statement and all members' opening statements uh, into, the record, into the record, and without objection, uh, I will do so. So I'm now pleased um, to introduce our distinguished 
witnesses. And I ask them to, um, to take their, their seats. Uh, Joel Simon is executive director of the Committee to Protect Journalists, CPJ. Marcel Granier is president and director general of Radio Caracas Televisión Internacional, better known to most of us as RCTV. Alejandra Nuno is the program director for Central America and Mexico at the Center for Justice and International Law, CEJIL. Next, Eduardo Enriquez is the managing editor of La Prensa in Nicaragua. And last but certainly not least, Alejandro Aguirre is the president of the Inter-American Press Association, IAPA, and deputy editor and publisher of Diario Las Americas. Welcome to all of you. We appreciate it. And um, uh, let me just uh, ask uh, you to, um, each one of you to please, um, uh, we, will, uh, we will submit your testimony into the record if we could ask you to uh, summarize uh, your testimony uh, in five minutes, and I'll, I'll keep uh, a close, uh, close tally. Uh, Mr. Simon, we'll start with you. Can you push the button, I think? It, yeah. I'm sorry. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, I will do my best to be brief. I note that the uh, members of the committee are exceptionally well informed on these issues based on your opening statement, so uh, you'll pardon me if I tread over uh, some ground which has already been raised by uh, committee members. Um, what I really want to start out by pointing out is that I've um, uh, been in my position at CPJ for more than a decade. I started out monitoring Latin America. I now have global responsibilities as executive director. And what I've seen is that while democracy has become firmly entrenched in much of Latin America, the press continues to operate with few institutional protections. And despite the strong tradition of independent and critical media in so many countries of the re in the region, journalists are increasingly vulnerable to both government repression and violence. Um, we're going to hear from witnesses in two countries, um, Venezuela and Nicaragua, uh, where governments are pursuing effective strategies of marginalizing and even vilifying the media while using control of government institutions, including the judiciary, to carry out legal action against critics. We published a very detailed uh, report uh, about the activities of President Daniel Ortega, which I've entered in the record. Uh, Ortega has set the tone in Nicaragua by calling journalists sons of Goebbels. Critics have faced punitive tax raids and criminal defamation suits. In Venezuela, President Chavez has employed a simil similar strategy, vilifying the press while using politicized administrative procedures to force critical broadcasters off the air. Uh, we've talked about uh, Mr. Zuluaga. The AP is reporting that he has now uh, left Venezuela uh, uh, in order to uh, avoid arrest. Um, well, journalists in these countries um, face government harassment. In other parts of the region, the problem is government neglect. And that's really the case in Mexico, where the situation there is extremely dramatic. 30 journalists have been killed or disappeared since President Felipe Calderon came to office. Most of these are local reporters covering drug trafficking, crime, or corruption, exactly as the uh, congressman pointed out. And impunity in these cases is near complete, and it's creating a pervasive culture of self-censorship, which is having a devastating effect um, on the basic right to freedom of expression in Mexico. I do want to point out, however, that one case involving a U.S. reporter, Brad Will, who was shot and killed in 2006 while covering protests in Oaxaca, and there is a video of that incident which appears to show a man later identified as a member of the pro-government pro militia firing a weapon directly at will. And despite this very clear evidence, no one has been convicted in that killing. Um, we talked a little bit about Honduras. Seven journalists killed there since the beginning of the year. That's also been getting attention. And in um, regards to some of the questions that have been asked here, we have, are carrying out a detailed report. We have a person who's just completed uh, his investigation and will be issuing a detailed report on the nature of those killings shortly. Um, Colombia, we have talked a little bit about Colombia. Colombia has made some improvements in terms of reduction of violence. I do want to point out uh, one issue that has concerned us, which has been mentioned, the adversarial relationship which President Uribe has had with the press, and also a, a very um, 
distress and scandal in which it was revealed that the DAS, which is the National Security Agency, had been wiretapping political opponents, magistrates, human rights activists, and journalists. CPJ's own emails were inter intercepted. Um, se subsequently, um, several um, senior DAS officials were arrested, and we met with President Oribe to discuss this issue, and he told us, quote, illegal spies are enemies of Colombia. I want to finally mention Cuba, um, far and away the most repressive environment for the press in Latin America. As mentioned, one of the worst in the world, 22 journalists in jail, um, ranked behind only Iran and China. Now there is some modest, some modest, there were some modest hopes at one time when Fidel Castro stepped inside. We have not seen any changes in Cuba under Raul Castro. I want to make that clear. And one thing I do want to mention in relation to um, the, the, the small incipient blogging culture in Cuba, it's been officially tolerated to a certain extent. And I do want to commend uh, President Obama for giving an, in, an email interview to a Cuban blogger, Yuani Sanchez, shortly after she was detained and beaten by Cuban security agents in November. Uh, that was an important gesture. So I want to conclude just by saying that efforts by the United States government to protect and promote press freedom are vital because we live in an information society. Those who, who are deprived of their of basic information are in essence marginalized. So the freedom to seek and receive information is not only a human right in this era. It is a pre prerequisite to full participation in the global economy. And that's why these hearings today are so important. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Simon. Mr. Granier. Thank you very much, Mr. You push the button, please. And thank I you. Thank you, Mr. Engel and our members of the subcommittee for this invitation to talk about things that would not be broadcast in, in Venezuela nowadays because of the censorship and the fear that exists over there. You ask me if there is freedom of expression in Venezuela, I would, my answer is no. Why do I say no? Because there are consequences to what you say that you cannot control. The, the judiciary power is fully controlled by the government. Most of the judges in Venezuela are provisional and therefore they can be changed at will by the authorities. The government also controls six uh, television networks and hundreds of radio stations that it uses in a, in a very efficient uh, and political way, not to inform people, but to criminalize everybody who dares have an opinion different to the government or to the president. In, uh, in the last 10 years, there have been about 150,000 murders in Venezuela. That is 10 times more than in the previous period. Of those 150,000 homicides, only 3% have ended with a conviction, and less than 10% have ever even been brought to court. Therefore, there are more than 140,000 homicides working around in the streets of Venezuela. Among those people murdered, there are more than 20 journalists or editors. What do they have in common? They were covering issues regarding corruption in the government or issues regarding drug trafficking and the involvement of high officers in such uh, drug trafficking. There is absolutely no transparency in Venezuelan public affairs. For example, nobody in Venezuela knows for sure how much oil do we produce? How much does Venezuela have in reserves? And of course, nobody knows what's happening with those 140,000 murderers that walk freely in our streets. There is no balance of powers. When the government decided to shut RCTV down, we went to the Supreme Court of Justice. We have been waiting for three years for their decision, nothing, no answer at all. The, the second time when they shut down RCTV International, there was not even a procedure. They just scared off the cable and satellite providers and the, those companies, private companies, 
some of them listed in the American, uh, in the New York Stock Exchange or in the European Stock Exchanges, were so scared to lose their privileges that they decided to take us off the air without any kind of due process of right to defend ourselves or anything similar to that. There is no presumption of evidence. Mr. Zuluaga, whom you mentioned a while ago, was first arrested without even a procedure opened against him. The procedure was opened three hours after he was arrested. So what do I think of the situation? I think perhaps we have the right to express ourselves, but we don't have the right to seek information where, where, of what we think is relevant. We have to fear the consequences. We don't know what the consequences are because they change the laws, they change the procedures. Sometimes they act even before anything, uh, b before um, accusing uh, you of anything. We're also in fear of the co uh, Cuban intelligence uh, services. In Venezuela, which is a very unusual case, the immigration, the identification, systems are controlled by the Cubans under a legal agreement that President Chavez signed with President Castro. The same applies to all public registries, marriages, births, deaths, property. All those are controlled by Cuban agents. Representative Smith was asking about China and the internet. I don't know what exactly is going on there, but I can tell you that Venezuela and China have signed hundreds of agreements Venezuela owes China billions of dollars, and you see a lot of Chinese people in Venezuela nowadays. And they are highly involved in the telecommunications industry. They hold the largest contracts with the telephone company that controls the internet in Venezuela. I think I'm out of time. Thank you very much, Mr. Granier. Ms. Nuno. Okay, we're all learning here how to use the microphones. Um, Chairman Engel and distinguished members of the subcommittee, uh, thank you for inviting the Center for Justice and International Law, CEGIL, to testify on press freedom in Honduras today. My name is Alejandra Nuño, CEGIL's Program Director for Central America and Mexico. CEGIL is a non-governmental organization dedicated since 1991 to defending and promoting human rights in the American continent through the strategic use of tools offered by international human rights law. We applaud the subcommittee for calling this timely hearing and for including Honduras as one of the countries in the Americas where press freedom is most under threat. We share the committee's concern about uh, threats to freedom of press situation in Mexico, Nicaragua, and Venezuela, and would add uh, Cuba to the list of nations where this right is severely restricted. Press freedoms have been limited in Honduras for many years, but 2010 has seen a bad situation become more worse, much worse. Honduras became this year the most dangerous country for journalists in the continent, while Mexico, with a population of more than 110 million, jur four journalists have been killed in 2000, 2010. In Honduras, with less than 8 million, eight journalists have been shot to death this, this year. I must point out that freedom of expression watchdogs have long criticized Honduran authorities for efforts to control or intimidate the media, including the use of public publicity contracts to punish or reward media for their content and paying individual reporters for, co for favorable coverage. Regarding a previous question from 2003, to mid-2009, the CPJ denounced three deaths related to the exercise in, journalis in journalism in Honduras. Um, after the army forced the then President Zelaya into exile in Costa Rica on June 28, the new authorities imposed severe restrictions on the media in order to st st stifle opposition to the coup. Several television channels and radio stations were occupied by, by the military and forced to suspend operations. Others were unable to report events on the air due to power cuts or the seizure of relay stations and transmitters. Others had their equipment confiscated. 
many reporters were assaulted, detained, or threatened. One radio reporter, Gabriel Pino Noriega of Estelar and Radio America, was shot dead on July 3rd as he left work. However, violence against journalists has reached an unprecedented level since this year. Many journalists continue to receive death threats related to their reporting. Several of these cases, including the persecution of journalists at, at Radio Progreso, La Voz del Occidente, and La Voz de Zacate Grande, are particularly urgent. These attacks on the media have a profoundly chilling effect on, free, on the free exchange of ideas in Honduras, making national reconciliation and the restoration of a meaningful democracy a distant dream. In Honduras, all branches of governments bear, bear responsibility with, when journalists face persecution. It is the duty to the state to prevent and the, and the duty of the judiciary to investigate such occurrences, to punish their perpetrators, and to ensure that victims receive due compensation. An effective investigation, along with other protective measures, can indeed prevent murders and other violent incidents. Nonetheless, we're extremely concerned by signs that these murders will be added to the ever-growing list of cases remaining in impunity. As it has been mentioned before, at least seven journalists were murdered between March 1st and the end of April for reasons that may be re related to their work. Seven journalists in two months. An eighth was killed on Monday. Those assassinated include TV journalists Joseph Hernandez Ochoa, Naum Palacios, Jorge Alberto Orellana, and just two days ago, Luis Arturo Mondragón Morazán. In addition, radio journalists David Mesa Montesinos, Manuel Juarez, Jose Vallardo Mairena, and add to the CPJ list, Luis Antonio Chévez Hernández have been slain. None of the victims appear to, be, to have been robbed. Each was shot to death by unidentified men. Many had received threats related to their work. In the case of reporter Naum Palacios, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights had called on, on Honduras to take urgent measures to protect his, his life, as the uh, special rapporteur just said. We have many recommendations for this subcommittee, but we'll uh, sum up in three. We urge the members of the Congress to use its power to effectively send a strong message to to the branches of the Honduran government that persecution of the media must stop and is urging to bring to justice those responsible for the deaths and threats against journalists. Also, right now, there are many discussions, discussions as to whether Honduras should be permitted to, the, to rejoin the, UA, the OAS. It would be a setback for press freedoms and human rights in the hemisphere if that would be done without a minimum human rights conditions inter alia putting an end to arbitrary interference with and persecution on the media, and of course, end impunity. And last but not least, one important way to, prom to provide su support for efforts to protect press freedoms and human rights in general would be the establishment of a local office of the H UN High Commissioner for Human Rights in Honduras. In my country, in Mexico, and many other places, it has been an effective way to monitor the situation and provide technical cooperation. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, very much, Ms. Nuno. Uh, Mr. Enriquez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we, I would like to start by saying that in Nicaragua we're living a process that is demolishing our constitution, our laws, and our institutions. Uh, in that process, uh, of course, freedom of the press is in the way, and to reach it, uh, freedom of the press has to suffer in the views of the government. Uh, the government, after having been in power in 1980, uh, learned the lessons of what we call prior censorship. It is not doing that anymore, but it's doing different things that in the end have the same results. Uh, I will limit to four uh, different ways in which the government uh, limits freedom of the press and freedom of expression. First is a policy of secrecy and uh, lack of transparency. Um, this was first uh, expressed in a secret document called Communication Strategy that uh, 
Ms. Rosario Murillo sent to uh, his uh, her uh, ministers at the beginning of the government in 2007. Uh, the, the document called for uh, lim limitation of the discussion of any uh, schemes or, or items to the agenda that was of interest to uh, the governments, not complete uh, lack of communication with free with the free press, which it was identified as enemies of the people, and uh, the use of the official uh, press for uh, the direct contact with uh, the people. So she said, the, our message is uncontaminated. This strategy then means that we have no access to information. The other strategy they use is the regulatory office of telecommunications. By using the, this uh, office, they uh, have been able to uh, eliminate any criticism from television and hardly any criticism exists in radio. Uh, one of the examples, Jaime Arellano, a political commentator, was thrown out of uh, Channel 10 due to uh, uh, government uh, pressures, and then he, he started his program again in Channel 2, and it did not last more than three months before it was again thrown out. Uh, Radio La Ley, which uh, belonged to a strong critic of the government, was not even allowed to go uh, on the air and Radio 15 de Septiembre uh, was uh, uh, basically bankrupt uh, due to pressures of uh, the government. Other radio stations uh, that have been critical like uh, Corporación, El Pensamiento, and Radio Darío have suffered uh, the same problem. The, govern the government is also using the budget for advertising, which is controlled by Murillo since uh, January of 2007, not to give advertisement to any critical uh, uh, media. That does not affect much La Prensa or, or, uh, or the big newspapers, but it has caused uh, the closing of many small radio stations and, and news programs, especially uh, in, in the interior of the country. Uh, and the daily newspapers are being uh, harassed with the unconstitutional uh, law that imposes a tax in the importation of paper, uh, which our constitution says that the import of paper uh, should be free of import taxes, and uh, the the Arce law, as named after Bayardo Arce, who, who was the one who enforced it or, or pushed for it, um, what does is to put a, a a tax on this paper, on the paper that we have to import and has caused uh, the price to hike. Therefore, less people are getting to uh, uh, read the papers and get information. If you add that to the problems of the TV stations, it's a problem uh, that less people are getting informa free information. There's also the example of Channel 8, in which the government, uh, basically Mr. Uh, Ortega and his business, Albaniza, which is in society with Hugo Chavez of Venezuela, but Channel 8, and uh, it's one less uh, independent outlet that we have in, uh, in our country. And uh, there is the harassment that constantly Channel uh, 4, which is also owned by Mr. Ortega, is not part of the government, it's owned by Mr. Ortega. Uh, it harasses uh, critical journalism uh, whenever they uh, have uh, the opportunity. Uh, at last, I would like to say that this scheme, Albaniza scheme, this um, business that Ortega has with Mr. Hugo Chavez is making him one of the richest men in the country, and he is trying to use this money to remain in power. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Enriquez. Mr. Aguero. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, it is a great honor for me to be here today. My name is Alejandro Aguirre, and I am the president of the Inter-American Press Association based in Miami, Florida, and I'm also a deputy editor and publisher of Diario Las Americas. The IAPA represents 1,200 newspapers and media outlets in the hemisphere. Since 1950, we've worked hard for fomenting a free flow of information and opinion in emerging, in emerging democracies through various programs, including our Chapultepec project, 
assisting news outlets in developed democracies as well as assisting journalists where news media are overtly or covertly suppressed especially in the investigation of assassinations through our impunity project in the last ten years political dynamics have changed to such a degree that many of the democratic successes achieved in the previous decades have been overturned and thousands of journalists in latin america and the caribbean are reporting under threat of incarceration or murder the suppression of the free press is typically exercised in two ways either through direct government sponsored actions or through an almost total breakdown in civil society in which terrorist groups and or drug cartels intimidate journalists at times aided by weak or corrupt local and law enforcement officials mr chairman and members of the subcommittee you are very familiar with the various political realities in latin america and time constraints don't permit me to go into many specific details here but just let me say that in the increase in media suppression in countries such as venezuela argentina cuba ecuador bolivia nicaragua brazil and others and the murder of journalists in countries such as mexico honduras and colombia are stifling the independent press as these actions are intended but for the brave voices who continue to report in any way they can despite the consequences the flow of information in many of these countries would be completely lost these men and women face direct threats against them and their families surveillance of their loved ones and ultimately brutal kidnapping and murder in venezuela the shutdown of rctv is now in its third year 34 radio stations and five television stations have been closed an arrest order was given for mr guillermo soluaga owner of globovision after president chavez criticized him just last week the order for arrest was made public the day the world cup started in Cuba, the half-century-old dictatorship allows no semblance of free speech as we know it. The women in white were physically attacked for demanding free speech, as was the blogger Yoani Sanchez. Twenty journalists remain in jail. Ecuador recently approved the communications law, which, among other things, requires a mandatory membership to a national journalist association, prior censorship, and a legal requirement to observe a government-mandated ethical conduct. These types of laws are becoming a disturbing trend in the hemisphere. We recognize President Obama for having expressed his concern for freedom of the press directly to the President of Ecuador, as well as Secretary of State Clinton and Assistant Secretary Valenzuela's discussions on this issue with the Ecuadorian, Ecuadorian government, and we applaud their efforts. There are a number of cases of judicial censorship in Venezuela, Peru, and Argentina and there is government censorship in Brazil in the newspaper O Estado. This is not just a threat to these countries, but it is also a threat to nations which live by the tenets of freedom of speech and the press. The suppression of freedom anywhere is a threat to freedom everywhere. Specifically, the loss of a free press in Latin America, I believe, poses a direct threat to the interests of the United States. Organized crime flourishes in places where there is little or no journalistic activity. These activities then lead on to greater infiltration of illegal drugs and weapons, in many cases crossing over U.S. borders. It creates an environment leading to the exodus of an economically viable population, which becomes a desperate population fleeing their home countries out of fear for their lives. Since the beginning of this year, 12 journalists have been murdered, at least, seven in Honduras, four in Mexico, and one in Colombia, and the whereabouts of six reporters who disappeared in Mexico in the same day remain unknown. The United States can continue to play a very important role in encouraging free press in the hemisphere and assisting those who are seeking to use their voice for the purpose of independent reporting. The role of the U.S. government and continued attention by this subcommittee is critical in this effort for the sake of this nation and the free world, because freedom of speech is the cornerstone of all democracies. Thank you again for this opportunity, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I look forward to any questions you may have. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Gary. And um, let me start with uh, Mr. Granier. Um, you have um, 
given us a uh, very uh, graphic uh, picture of the uh, lack of um, press freedoms in Venezuela, basically confirming what many of us have, have heard and have been, been saying. Um, the international community has been unified in condemning uh, actions taken by President Chavez against RCTV. Uh, the European Union and the U.S. Senate both passed resolutions in support of RCTV and human rights organizations, including Human Rights Watch and the Washington Office on Latin America, have been outspoken. Um, the Organization of American States Independent Human Rights Mechanisms also have stood in solidarity with you. Uh, what I'm really asking, basically, is, is, is how can we help? What can we do? What more can the international community do to support you and other journalists and media owners in Venezuela? What would be most helpful? Because we're all concerned about it, and as you can see, it cuts across party lines. Well, first of all, I would say we have an election coming on September 26th. The government, through the Electoral Council, is not allowing international uh, witnesses to come and watch the election. Per perhaps if democratic parliaments from all over the world insisted on being present there, even if not invited, to see what's going on, to prevent any fraud, that would be very helpful. The Organization of American States, as uh, Ms. Botero said, has two different uh, concerns, so to say. One is the protection of human rights, and we feel perfectly happy with all the work they have done. The other is the political side of the Organization of American States, which seems to be stifled and uh, seems to be no help at all for democracy in, in the continent. I mean, I, I've been reading, and actually the Secretary General gave me today another copy of the Democratic Inter-American Democratic Chart, and I read it and I ask myself, what's the purpose of this charter? If we have violations of against democracy and freedoms and rights happening in Venezuela, in Bolivia, in Ecuador, in Nicaragua, in Honduras, in so many places, in Cuba. Well, Cuba is not a member, so what, what is the He wrote us a very nice letter uh, after the closure of RCTV International, the Secretary General, offering his mediation. I answered his letter, accepting the mediation, and came to Washington to ask him further to, to go to Venezuela and to see what's happening there. I mean, hundreds of students who have protested in the streets are now under, are subject to, to criminal procedures that could mean for, for those kids between 18 and 24 years in prison, in a Venezuelan prison. By the way, Venezuelan prisons are the most dangerous of all prisons in the continent, and that's been proven time and again. And so I, I came here, I asked him to go to Venezuela to see what was happening, not only to media, I mean over 30, 34 radio stations shut down, several television stations shut down, students imprisoned or persecuted. And he hasn't been there because the government of Venezuela has not asked him to go there. So something has to be done, I think, regarding the, the, the powers of, of the, so to answer your question, perhaps give more power to the Organization of American States or reorganize it and be present at the election on September 26. Let me ask you one other question, Mr. Garnier. Uh, how, how much opposition media uh, remains in Venezuela, uh, both on uh, the radio and TV and the, and the printed uh, media, printed press? How much, how much remains? In, in television, the only independent station is uh, Globovision, which is under terrible threats right now. Not only there is an order to imprison Mr. Zuluaga, also his son, and his uh, the, uh, one other shareholder in, in, in the station is also subject to, I mean, his bank was shut down and he's being persecuted now. No, none of the others are not even independent, um, not even neutral, I would say. On average, they broadcast three and a half hours 
of Chavez's propaganda or of Chavez's speeches a day. On average, three and a half hours a day on every radio and television station in Venezuela. I can provide you with those figures if you, if you want to. In, in, the, in the printed press, the situation is very, is different. It's, they are facing a very tough economic situation. In Venezuela, for five quarters, the economy has been slowing down at a very fast pace. We've been losing ground at about 5% uh, per quarter, and it, it appears to be getting worse. On top of that, there is inflation. In, in printed media, well, in all media in general, advertising income grows more than proportionally when a gross domestic product is going up, but it, it also decreases more than proportionally. So they are in a very tough situation. On top of that, for their, um, for their print, they need uh, dollars in order to acquire. Venezuela is not a, a, a paper print uh, producer and it, it is not a, a printing machine producer. So all spare parts, all paper print, uh, all most of the of the things you need to, to do a paper, excepting the, the work of the journalists, has to be imported. For that, you need foreign currency. Uh, for the past, uh, in, in the past four m weeks, foreign currency has practically been not available to anybody. And now it's becoming available in, very, in a very short supply and controlled by a partisan organization. So they depend on the goodwill of those people to get the, the, the newsprint they need and, and, the, and, the, and the very small stations, what are called community stations, they depend on a budget provided by the government. If they carry news that the government doesn't like, their license is canceled and we have several cases of that happening. So in general, I would say there are, I mean, five or six newspapers over the country and some independent journalists that still do their work. But I have, and I will end with this, the, the, the president of the uh, newspaper, uh, of the Journalists Association is ending his term right now. And he was looking for a job. Nobody wanted to give him a job because as president of the Journalist Association, he had a critical position regarding some measures taken by the government. So th the government doesn't like him. So he's moving away from the country. And that's happening to several other journalists. Thank you. Mr. Enriquez, let me ask you a, just a, qu a quick question. Um, in Nicaragua, there were mu municipal elections that were held a couple of years ago that were generally um, thought to be fraudulent. Can the opposition uh, press write about that? Yes, uh, the opposition press can write about, uh, about that. Uh, in fact, we uh, have done a lot of investigations about how the fraud was uh, committed. Um, nevertheless, wh whenever we do that or whenever we launch an investigation on, on the government, uh, we uh, are usually attacked either personally or uh, in, uh, uh, during Mr. Ortega's speeches. In one occasion, uh, uh, he even called those um, that we were doing media terrorism. And on the anniversary of that fraud uh, that Ortega celebrated it as a big victory, um, there was a caravan of, 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 of his uh, followers uh, or people that he also, because there are also people that he uh, pays uh, to to go to these uh, um, to, to these uh, uh, speeches, and, and they attacked uh, la prensa uh, with the stones and and morteros, and they, they caused some damage. So they they hold us directly responsible uh, for uh, uh, for the reaction, the international reaction that provoked this uh, fraud. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mack. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and. Uh, uh, I've, I've only got one, maybe two questions, because uh, I know we're running out of, out of time. But um, I want to pick up on the OAS, and I'd like to ask uh, each one of you if you believe that the OAS 
uh, is promoting freedom of the press and uh, democracy in the hemisphere, or do you think it is a hindrance by not, you know, almost the inaction of the OAS is creating a scenario in which some of these countries feel like they can follow in Chavez's lead. Uh, so I'd like to, if we could just go down the line and kind of give me your opinion of whether or not you think the OAS is functioning properly uh, and, and if you think it should be reorganized. Can you uh, push the, the button? button? Yeah. That again, sorry. Uh, as someone who was involved uh, many years ago uh, with the creation of the Special Rapporteur's uh, Office uh, and advocated for the creation of that position, uh, I can say that the addition of that office has uh, created a greater emphasis within the structure of the OAS that focuses on human rights, and that is to the advantage. Um, it is uh, hugely important to have an advocate like uh, Catalina Botera within the organization uh, making sure that these issues um, are brought to the attention of the organization. I, I have to say honestly that I don't, I cannot think of a recent example in which the, um, uh, the um, uh, political part of the organization uh, was directly involved in efforts that successfully defended um, the right to freedom of expression or press freedom. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. I think it's proven to be totally useless. I mean, it's been no help whatsoever in defending democracy or in defending freedom of expression or in defending rights of any kind. It, it's sad to say that. On the other hand, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights I is the only international court w we have to go to with our problem. And th the problem is that th they have no teeth with their uh, decisions. So their decisions are not implemented until there is a, a government willing to accept them. Regarding the, the rapporteur, well, I'm glad Ms. Botero is here, but I mean, she's been the only person willing to listen. For example, in, in my personal case, I've been threatened to death and bombs have been thrown at my home. The only person who's listened to that complaint is Ms. Botero. I mean, I went to the, to the attorney general in Venezuela, I went to the civil courts, I went to the penal courts, I went to all the possible authorities in Venezuela and nothing has been done. I mean, th those people, and they, are, they, ha they have been clearly identified, walk around the streets in Venezuela. There is a documentary produced by a Spanish television station showing them acting freely. They've been trained by the army. They've been uh, not only trained by the army, they are protected by the army, they are supplied by the army. So regarding the rapporteur uh, for freedom of expression and the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, I think their work is commendable and they should be held in that. Regarding the Inter-American, uh, I mean the Democratic Chart, this has to be reviewed. I mean, it's no use at all. Thank you. I agree with uh, the, the comments. I, I have to say that it is important to make a difference within the uh, human rights organs, the Inter-American Commission and the Inter-American Court on Human Rights. They have done a terrific job, not only the, the rapporteurship on, on freedom of expression, but for example, the Inter-American Court has issued in Nicaragua, it has ordered the, the Nicaraguan state to modify the legislation so that the elections cannot, uh, well, the fraud in, ele in elections cannot take place. And I think that uh, I, I agree with Mr. Garnier when he says that um, we have um, one challenge is to comply with those resolutions. Those resolutions are very, very important. And right now we have to fight that, uh, or, or we, we have to lobby for those resolutions to be, to be complied with. I think that the OAS and other, and the, the, the countries that are part of the OAS, including the US, of course, um, need to give more budget to the commission and to the court. They have done a terrific job and they need more budget and more resources to, uh, to continue doing this terrific, uh, terrific work. 
Regarding the, the, the OIS, um, I just want to say that, yes, there are many challenges, many challenges uh, regarding democracy specifically. We, we were in, in Lima in the OIS General Assembly and we were saying, for example, there has to be a follow-up mechanism for this uh, inter, uh, Inter-American Demo Democratic Charter. We were um, um, urging the, the OIS member states, for example, to give funding and uh, support for the creation of a special rapporteurship that really monitors and prevents and uh, informs the OIS uh, member states on uh, specific democracy or issues that, or freedom of expression issues that are really threatened our nations. So uh, maybe that is one, one way to, um, I don't know, to, to try to support those efforts and of course to, uh, to make them more stronger b because they, are, they lack uh, many effective uh, um, ways right now. I think the OAS has to go through a complete overhaul. Right now, the way it's working, it's, uh, to me, a president's club. And uh, I, what I say, what I mean by that is that only when a president is interested in bringing an issue to uh, the OAS is uh, uh, it can be, he, can, he can be listened or the issue can be taken into consideration. Uh, we could see how Mr. Insulza during the, uh, the crisis in Honduras, um, he traveled down to Managua uh, to an emergency meeting, tried to defend the democracy in Honduras. The funny thing was that right beside him was Raul Castro, and uh, that was incredible to me, uh, that he was trying to defend democracy in Honduras while Raul Castro was beside him with 50 years in government in, uh, as a dictator. So I think that, uh, uh, it has to go through a great overhaul because they put a lot of attention when a president, uh, you know, uh, is uh, uh, for uh, naming it in a way in trouble. But uh, in Nicaragua, we are leaving a permanent coup and no one is listening, in, at least at the OAS. Uh, and those are not my words. These are the permanent coup was used when one of, one of the uh, most respected lawyers in Nicaragua, because it is a permanent coup that he's usually, he, Ortega, is uh, doing against the Supreme Court, against the National Assembly, against the um, uh, uh, electoral, su Supreme Electoral Council. So as, as I said, uh, if it's gonna work, we have to change the way it works. Congressman, uh, when I was a young man, I remember hearing a quote from a former Secretary General of the OAS who said that the OAS will be what the member states want it to be. And I can only give you a personal opinion to your question, but I think that when you have uh, many governments in the hemisphere that are democratic in origin, but uh, as time goes by, at behave in more authoritarian ways, that's the kind of policies that you will see reflected in the OAS. And I think that's why uh, people perceive a double standard with the organization uh, at, at its worst or at, at its best, an inability to really uphold uh, uh, human rights, universal human rights that, that the organization is, is sworn to uphold. And I don't think that that's going to be able to be changed under the current system. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I just would like to, uh, I agree with um, uh, our panel today that the OAS, uh, in my opinion, is a hindrance, not a help, and it needs to be changed uh, because if not, we're not going to get the real change that we need in Latin America. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Be before I call on Mr. Ceres, uh, I want to just note that uh, we've been uh, called for a series of votes, so we have a few minutes left. But, and uh, m Mr. Aguirre, I still think you're a young man, so don't, uh, you know, don't put yourself down. <laughs> Mr. Ceres. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, I keep hearing about Chavez money going into Nicaragua, going into Argentina, going into the, you know, going to these other places. I was just wondering how much of that has an impact on the press and the people, how they report things. Anyone want to take a, Mr. Grania? I, I'm always reading about how much money Chavez throws into these countries, you know, Bolivia, uh, Nicaragua, 
and Argentina and some of these other places, how much do you think that impacts the press? You know, we have a saying in Spanish, a la prensa se le pega o se le paga. You know, we have a saying in Spanish, you either pay the press or you beat it up. <laughs> so I was just wondering, uh, Mr. Aguirre? Congressman, I think that's, that's an excellent question. I was told uh, at one time that uh, during the Nicaraguan presidential elections, almost $400 million of aid uh, was given to the government of Nicaragua uh, for political purposes. If you consider the size of the country and the GDP of the country, that's huge. And because of the way that uh, the government used this money to create uh, uh, groups uh, that sometimes turn to violence or, uh, or intimidating acts uh, to the opposition, that definitely has a chilling effect on the press because uh, the independent press is not a friend of these types of regimes. And that kind of, uh, just that amount of money gives you such a, an incredible amount of influence and, uh, and power that you really can start to act with impunity. Mr. Enrique? Uh, well, in Nicaragua, we have seen how the example of Channel 8, they just went out and bought it, and, and now it's another outlet for, uh, for Ortega. Uh, there has been other cases of small uh, TV stations and, and radio stations uh, in which they are simply working with the government. They are, as Mr. Bernier said, uh, not even neutral uh, because they are receiving uh, a heavy amount of advertising, and, and that advertising and the payment does not come out of, of the budget usually beca because they don't have enough money, but it com comes out of Albaniza. Uh, we have also uh, seen how they um, have money that they, they do not report to anyone, and uh, they, they can contract these kind of people uh, to, to be aggressive against, against independent uh, uh, press. $400 million is what Ortega, in according to our calculations, Ortega is receiving each year since 2008. Mr. Walter Mann, Mr. Granier. <laughs> in the Venezuelan case, it hasn't worked at all. Uh, in 12 years, I haven't seen one single journalist who changed his position regarding Chavez because of any undue influence from the government. I could not say the same for media owners. I've seen plenty of them who were strongly against Chavez at one point in time, and then they were seduced by easy dollars or by advertising from the government or by special concessions. Regarding other countries, I think it depends on on the quality of the press. For example, in Argentina, he, Chavez has dilapidated billions of dollars, and yet you see the Argentinian press is still independent. Both La Nación and Clarín are independent. You can see the same with the radio and television stations. In, in Chile, he has spent a lot of money uh, pro promoting uh, underground groups, and it, it hasn't worked very well in, in Peru, in even in Ecuador, in Ecuador, the, the press still remains independent. You have, uh, I mean, all the papers like uh, El Comercio, Hoy, or I mean, several papers in both in Guayaquil and in uh, in, in Quito. So I think it depends on the quality of, of the press in in each country. Regarding Venezuela, I, I repeat, I have not seen one single journalist who was turned pro-government because he was paid or anything. They have not been convinced, neither by arguments nor by money. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I would ask the panel, just as I asked Ms. Patero, to look into the deployment of Chinese uh, cyber police in Venezuela, Cuba, Nicaragua, and anywhere else, because I do think under the cover of, of working on the media, their worst practices are being replicated, and it is the way of shutting down. Uh, you, it's not, it's harder to tax paper, or it's easy to tax paper, a little harder to tax the internet, so please look into that. Let me just point out uh, another point. In 1984, and Mr. Enriquez, you make the point that the Carlos Fernando Chamorro uh, from Barricada uh, has gone over to the opposition side. 
Uh, how do the people react when you're attacked, La Prenza's attacked, when are they attacked as well? And I would note parenthetically that back in 1984, you know, just to get a, a little glimpse of just how harsh some of these people can be, Barricada, uh, three other members of Congress and I went and met with Ortega, fought with him in an argument about human rights for about two hours, uh, and the way that they misrepresented us uh, was astounding. I mean, we get bad press here sometimes. You can write a letter to the editor. But it was just, I mean, it was grossly misinformation, gross misinformation. And um, it just taught me a lesson of just how bad some of these groups can be. And finally, the Human Rights Council, uh, Venezuela, uh, uh, Nicaragua and Cuba have both gone through their universal periodic reviews. Press freedom issues were raised. I know the universal periodic review, they suggested a monitor go to Cuba. And I was there with Amanda Valadares when he won the first resolution on Cuba at the old Human Rights Commission. And frankly, uh, everyone who talked to that commission, uh, who happened to be a political prisoner, uh, was retaliated against. And yet the UN continues to have Cuba sitting as a member in good standing on the Human Rights Council. That is an ap absolute outrage and makes a mockery of the Human Rights Commission and the Human Rights Council or, and, and those who permit it at the UN ought to hang their heads in shame that such a rogue nation could sit there, run interference for other rogue nations, including themselves. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Smith. Um, I, I want to thank uh, all, the, uh, all the panelists for a very, very good testimony. You know, we talked about hypocrisy. I think, Mr. Enriquez, you mentioned the hypocrisy of uh, Raul Castro uh, being concerned about uh, freedom in Honduras when he had provides none uh, for his own country. Um, we had to chuckle before when we saw that uh, Nicaragua uh, suspended relations with Israel because um, it objected to the incident on the flotilla. Uh, when there are no freedoms, as you pointed out, Mr. Enriquez, in, in, in Nicaragua, uh, limited freedoms in terms of, in terms of press freedom. And uh, similarly with Ecuador, uh, they recalled its ambassador to Israel uh, to, to protest, but yet we had the El Universo, the Emilio Palacio, uh, get being given a, a jail sentence, and we've had Mr. Uh, Correa's uh, statements about press in this country, which, which concerned uh, Secretary Clinton, who, who uh, made some comments about it as well. So, you know, I think that um, hypocrisy, uh, you know, reigns supreme, but um, uh, this committee, this subcommittee, will, will continue to, to focus attention on the freedoms of the press uh, in all these places. And uh, I thank all of you for your really good, all five of you, for your really good uh, expert uh, testimony and uh, your concerns. I think that if we bring these things to light and we keep shining a light on them, that's the best way to, to make sure that uh, they are uh, changed and that we have the freedom of the press that the peoples of, of all the Americas deserve. So thank you very much for your great testimony, and the hearing is now adjourned.